Now that we have defined Gaussian processes, let's have a closer look at what kind of functions can be generated uh, when I make a specific choice for the kernel. We're going to focus on the kernel because it will eventually be the kernel that, that fully determines the characteristics of the functions that are drawn from uh, my Gaussian process. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to work with a fixed grid, so a fixed set of points x1 up to xn on which I'm going to evaluate the functions that are drawn from this uh, Gaussian process. And remember that the function evaluated at this fixed point x is a random variable in itself. So I'm essentially observing an n-dimensional uh, random variable. Then what I'm going to do for simplicity, I'm just going to set uh, my predictive mean or this mean function to uh, the constant zero and let my uh, random vector or my functions be fully determined uh, by this uh, kernel function. So from a practical point of view, I'm just sampling n-dimensional vectors from some Gaussian distribution with a covariance matrix. And this covariance matrix is given by the Gram matrix, right? So the, the matrix that consists of all these pairwise evaluations between all the point pairs uh, of this kernel function. So once I have built this Gram matrix for a particular choice of kernel, I can just sample my uh, functions or the, these, these vectors uh, from this uh, multivariate Gaussian. Okay, then in this video, we're going to consider the following kernel. And this kernel consists of this uh, exponential part, so uh, the exponential part, and it consists of this uh, part, which I'm going to say is uh, the linear part. And later it will become clear why we can call this uh, the linear part, essentially because it's linear with respect to only one of these uh, variables. But okay, we have this, this kernel of this particular exponential form and it has these four parameters, right? So it has uh, theta zero, which uh, sort of amplifies this exponential over here. We have this uh, theta one, which sort of scales the distance between point pairs. Uh, sorry, this is an m actually, so xn minus xm. And then we have a theta two term, which is like a global offset in this kernel. And then we have this linear term uh, determined uh, weighted with this uh, theta three parameter. And what I'm going to do in the remaining uh, slides, I'm going to explore what the influence is, or what the effect is of, of choosing a particular theta and see what kind of uh, functions roll out of this uh, Gaussian process. So what we're going to do in this experiment, we're going to sample uh, function values on this grid of points. So I'm go going to sample these x1s or these xn's from minus 5 to 5. So this is the interval that I'm considering and I'm going to uniform it's uniformly sample this with, with n points. So really what you see over here, for example, this red curve is this function evaluated at all these uh, sample uh, regions or sample locations. And then it's going to look a continuous if I uh, let n go to infinity. So basically in this experiment, I set n to be uh, very large. Okay, so then I have all these n data points, I can pre-compute uh, my uh, gram matrix, right? Is this kernel uh, k? Basically, I'm going to evaluate this kernel k for all these uh, point pairs in my uh, set of grid points. And then in order to generate my random vector, I sample just from a uniform uh, uncorrelated distribution of length n. So I'm going to just pick this random variable and then, then I'm going to apply this uh, reparameterization trick, right? So I want my uh, vector to be distributed according to this covariance matrix, but I'm going to do the following. I'm going to uh, split this uh, covariance matrix into these two symmetric parts and I can do that, remember this. Uh, we can do this with a Koleski uh, decomposition or an Eigen decomposition. Because once I've done this uh, factorization, I can just sample from this uh, uniform uh, Gaussian distributed distribution and then generate my random sample f just by, by this linear mapping, right? So that's the reparameterization trick that I explained before. Okay, so this is the recipe for generating these random uh, functions. So every time I sample such an f, I generate a different vector, which is going to be plotted here as this uh, continuous function. So now let's see what happens if I turn on or off some of these uh, components. Uh, in this case, I'm going to focus on this uh, particular uh, theta zero term, so this prefactor, and I'm going to turn off, uh, well, uh, this part essentially. I'm going to set theta two and theta three to zero. 
And essentially what you see is that now the amplitude of my signal increases. It's still a random signal, but now it lies in this interval of a minus four to four somewhat. Uh, and in this experiment, actually, I set t to zero to one and you see less, way less uh, amplitude in these oscillations. So this uh, t to zero component uh, encodes for amplitude. And that's somewhat expected, right? Because this uh, kernel essentially characterizes the covariance matrix of these functions that are uh, sampled uh, from it. And if k is just multiplied by some constant, so it means I blow up this uh, covariance and thus I have uh, larger variations. Okay, so theta zero uh, encodes for uh, the amplitude of my uh, sampled functions. And now what I'm going to do next, now I'm going to focus on this theta one term. So this particular term over here. And uh, still I'm, I'm turning off this, this linear part. And now just by inspecting this formula, you can already tell that this sort of uh, encodes a length scale of covariance, right? Uh, because this is the distance, sorry again a typo, this is the distance between n, uh, xn and xm. And if this distance is small, this exponential takes on a, a, a large value and, and thus there is high covariance between these points. And then this theta one determines how quickly this particular term decays to zero if points move away from it. And if theta one is small, then I quite quickly decay to zero, this exponential term quite quickly decays to zero when points get uh, further apart. So, so that's maybe best visualized if I compare it to uh, this different uh, experiment where I set theta one to two. So here I set it to 0.5 and we see this uh, oscillations over here. So it's quite kind of wiggly. But then if I turn it up to a factor two, then we see we get a much more smoother signal, right? Because now I increase the length scale at which a points covariate uh, together. So that means if this point takes a, a high value, then the points surrounding it should also take a, a high value. So we have this long correlation uh, length scale. Now that also means that if I let this uh, theta one parameter uh, become very small, so now it was uh, smaller than uh, in this case. So here I have a smooth function and here it becomes more wiggly. But if I let this go to zero, then re this really means that this exponential only takes on the value one when xn and xm are exactly the same. But if they are different, then it immediately decays to zero. So that means that if theta one goes to zero, then my kernel uh, converges to this identity matrix. And that in turn means that um, I'm actually just sampling points from a uh, uniform uh, Gaussian distribution. So that means that eventually for a small theta one, I would actually be just looking at random noise really, or white noise, uh, I should say actually. Okay, now let's take a look at this offset term theta two. Uh, so I am actually going to turn off still this particular part and for this I make some re reasonable choices, theta zero and theta one. And I call it an offset term because if I now look at these functions, they vary a lot uh, in their offset, right? So this function is clearly higher than this particular sample, sampled function. And that has to, to do with the fact that uh, this particular uh, theta two induces a correlation which is independent of position. So, so that means if uh, one of my random variables is, is large, then all the other random variables should also be large, right? Because independent of whatever the location or the relative position to this point, uh, they are correlated. So this point is correlated with this point via this uh, t2 term over here. So let's take a look at a, an extreme case. So what we do here, we set this term off and we set uh, this term off as well. So now it becomes really clear that we're looking at this offset uh, t2, right? And this essentially means we have this a uh, perfect correlation between my data points, right? Uh, because if this point uh, takes on my particular value, then all my other points have to take on the exact same value uh, because we have this correlation over here, which doesn't depend on X. It just says that each point is equally correlated with one another. And that results to uh, the fact that I'm now observing straight lines every time I sample a, a function from this Gaussian process. Okay, then also, let's have a look at this linear term. I call this a linear term, uh, theta three, so this particular part. And I'm going to turn off this uh, offset term again. So what you see now, it, it seems that these random functions, so they're still random, but it seems that they have some drift in them. So they have a particular uh, slope. And this is why we can call this actually a, a linear term.
And again, this is uh, amplified this effect when I set all the other attempts to zero, right? So I'm now turning off this exponential fully. I'm turning off this offset term, and I'm only going to look at this this linear uh, covariance term over here. And uh, maybe you should think of it this way. So this is an inner product between two data points, right? And this inner product is large, when, so it's a sort of similarity measure. So when two points are exactly the same, it takes on a high value. And then when you move away from it, uh, then it decreases. And if you move in the, the same direction of this X, uh, then then it keeps on uh, amplifying its its magnitude, this inner product. So we have this linear behavior, behavior in uh, when points are similar, it's high when they are dissimilar. So moving away from it, it gets smaller and moving towards it, it gets higher. And when my random variable is, or my axes are just a 1D point, then we clearly has, have this uh, linear behavior. Okay, so now we got some feeling about what kind of functions can be generated with Gaussian processes. And uh, we considered the uh, kernels of this exponential form with these uh, four parameters and we sort of tweak them and see what, what's happening. And now that we have some feeling, let's in the next video actually do some probabilistic modeling with such Gaussian processes. And so with that, I mean, uh, these Gaussian processes, they define a sort of distribution over the functions that I'm going to use to, to model data. Uh, but they're not informed by the data themselves, right? They do completely different every time I sample it. And now I want to adapt these distributions of functions that can represent my data. I'm going to adapt them based on the data itself. So in that sense, I'm trying to recover a posterior distributions, uh, bit distribution for functions that could uh, potentially fit to my data.